today on Compassion Radio. One of the people that I thought was most influential with the students on that campus was not a professor. And I said it was the person who runs a little cafe in one of the lobbies of one of the buildings. And I thought to myself that this person should probably be paid as much as any professor on that campus. Probably should. Because she probably has as much influence. And I've told her that too. And so the spirit is alive and working. The question is whether or not we're observant enough to listen to those around us who are not the powerful and the wealthy and all, because that's often where we learn the most. Hello, and welcome back to Compassion Radio with Bram Floria. On this program, we connect you with people both here in the United States and all over the world who live their lives in a missional way. As Christians, are we really called to be our brother's keeper? And if we are, what does that actually mean? Here's Bram. Frank, now that is a loaded question. And it comes from the verse in Genesis chapter 4, verse 9, quoting Cain, the first known murderer of the Bible, Am I my brother's keeper? Think about the context of that. The first person in the Bible that we learn of that actually has contempt for God's word looks at him face to face and says, What? Am I supposed to take care of him? The words in Hebrew that we have in the Bible are very, very simple. Eshmir Aki Anki. But there's a lot in those words. They simply mean, What? Am I supposed to see him as somebody that I'm supposed to take care of? He can take care of himself. There's all kinds of emotions packed into that. But the lesson we learn from that, of course, from Judeo-Christian tradition is, Abel was loved by God. And Jesus took this to a whole new extreme when he said, the biggest command, the only command that matters is, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second one is just like it. Love your brother as yourself. And we know that the person that asked the question of Jesus wanted to defend themselves and said, well then, who's my brother? And then we have this whole long list of stories about what it means to be loving, caring, compassionate, all the things that Jesus loaded into his parables. That's all part of this question. So if you're asking me as a Christian today, Frank, what I think God means by being our brother's keeper, it's to take seriously the perspective of Jesus and the things he told us, commanded us to do. And in doing those things, we literally show God that we love him. And I think we're going to go deeper into that question today. Friends on Compassion Radio today, I get the chance to interview a mentor I've never known, if that makes any sense. Dr. Q, Quentin Schultz, PhD from Calvin College and many other applications of that knowledge over the years. Welcome to Compassion Radio. Hey, it's a joy, Bram. Great to meet you. I wish I'd had you as a student. Yeah, I wish I would have been there under your tutelage during those years. But over the years since, getting involved with broadcasting and seeing the work you did with GospelCom and how you turned toward the new technologies and saw the wave coming where the the kingdom of God was going to be living and vibrantly living within the online environment. You foresaw that years ago, and I'm grateful that you've stayed in the game and that you are still willing to get out there and mentor and pontificate and to prognosticate. We need people that can look forward and help us to find our way, and you're one of those kind of people. Oh, thanks so much. Now, you've written a number of books along the way helping people to communicate, mostly focused on executives and people that are in leadership. You tend to be the guy that everyone trusts. You're the kind of guy that supports and encourages and brings out the best in leaders, whether they're pastors or corporate executives, leaders of nonprofit organizations. So tell me a little bit about how God brought you to the point of being that kind of, for lack of a better term, a guru when it comes to leadership within the nonprofit environment. Well, Bram, you're asking a very, very difficult question for me to address because it's so personal. Uh, I grew up in a horrible family situation. My father was an alcoholic until he died when I was in high school. My mother was a paranoid schizophrenic. She actually became a schizophrenic when, Mm. after having me, she ended up in the hospital with tuberculosis and with the postpartum depression after having me being in the hospital all alone, her terrible anxiety and depression kicked in. And I never remember her not being a schizophrenic and being in and out of reality. My parents were divorced when I was in fifth grade. I ended up living in a kind of a ramshackle trailer with my mother trying to survive. And it was very, very difficult. The good side of it, though, was that it taught me how to care for myself. Mm. I had to be responsible for myself. I could not avoid being responsible for myself, or I would have been in deep trouble really, really fast. My mother and I both would have been. 
So earlier in life than most people, I became responsible. Now, switch ahead into college where I became a Christian by the grace of God through friends that I had made, wonderful people. My best friends were Christians and shared the gospel with me. And once I started to get into God's word, I realized there was something about my growing up and our calling as human beings and my calling as a Christian that that all connected. Hmm. And that was this sense of personal responsibility, that we are not called in any sense as human beings or as followers of Christ to give up caring, but in fact, we're called to be caretakers of ourselves and those around us. I see following Jesus as a particular way of being a responsible and thereby being a leader. Leaders are the ones who identify and accept and then act upon responsibility around them. That's really how I define leadership. It's it's those who, for whatever reason, however it comes about, say, aha, there's something going on here that's not the way it should be or it could be better. I'm going to accept responsibility for that, and I'm going to act upon it. Now, that's the kind of situation I grew You're up in. You're talking about an integrated life. I know that's very much part of the Reformed tradition, saying that everything that we do, everything we think, everything we know, everything we say, it all matters. And it's all part of the whole that God's building throughout our lives. And I get that theology. I understand how important it is for us to act on our faith in ways that are consistent with the truth that's in the Word of God. And to find its application as much as God allows us to and gives us the capacity to within our lives. But you're also talking about things that are touching a little bit too close for some people, saying, I want to compartmentalize my life. I want to be able to go to church, and then I want to go to work. But that's not the option that God gave you. No, it's not. And I think to be a follower of Jesus means we open up to the needs of the world around us, wherever those are. However immediate they are, we walk out in the street and say a neighbor, and the neighbor seems down. What do we do? How do we respond? That's a kind of immediate calling to that situation. Then there are the bigger ones that have to do with where we work, ones that have to do with our church communities and so forth. Uh, I see all of these as the stations of life. Mm. So we have a shared vocation or calling, which is to follow Jesus. That's our calling. And then we, in our own ways, in our own lives, have all these different stations, which are represented by the needs around us. And we need to address those. And some of those are outright needs for the gospel. And others are needs in communities where the gospel resides and people are growing and being nurtured. But then they have other kinds of needs as well. And so I guess I grew up in a situation where I tend to see the needs around me and I want to do something about them. You're listening to Compassion Radio with Bram Floria. There's a lot more coming up, so please stay with us. In this season of thanks and giving, I want to start by thanking you for all the ways you've supported our work and witness. I mean that. Even if you've never supported us financially in the past, the very fact of your presence, your willingness to spend these important minutes of your day to hear what God is doing around the world, that in itself is a gift. To God, because He wants His work known. And to us, because I know you'll really think and pray about what you've heard. And I know that will bring about the kind of spiritual fruit in you that will feed the world. Whatever's going on in your heart from the things you hear on Compassion Radio, I hope you'll take a moment to let us know about it. You can email anytime. The address is info at CompassionRadio.com. Now, as we head into this most important giving season of 2021, I hope you'll take to heart this important truth. Compassion Radio has always been a collaborative venture. We partner with you to pray God's will into the world around us and His power and protection for those doing His work in the world's toughest places. We've partnered with so many wonderful, intrepid ministries over the years, and we're still working hard to fulfill our faith goals for special projects this year. Things like our long-standing Bible projects, providing new copies of the Word to believers who have requested one in countries like China, Burma, and Iran and likewise to provide nourishment and a safe home to abandoned orphans in South Africa. If you'll give generously and bravely this year, we'll be able to complete our faith goals to these partners and to end the year where we need it to be, financially able to begin 2022 without any outstanding debts. We're a lean team, just a handful really, and we have no ambitions to grow a major corporation here. Our ambition is simply this, to provide you with real, life-changing teaching and encouragement and opportunities for changing lives around the world through special projects. It can't happen without you, so I ask. 
even if you've never done it before, would you help us? Your gift today is vitally important. Here's how to reach us. Our toll-free phone number is 1-800-868-2478. That's 1-800-868-2478. Our mailing address is Box 2770, Orange, California, 92859. And our website is, simply enough, CompassionRadio.com. However you decide to reach out and join us with your prayers and financial gifts, please know that we are deeply grateful for the support and partnership. haven't changed. My love's still the same. You're still Lord to me. You're still Lord. And now, back to Compassion Radio with Bram Floria. You're still my father. To be a follower of Jesus means we open up to the needs of the world around us, wherever those are. However immediate they are, we walk out in the street and say, a neighbor and the neighbor seems down, what do we do? How do we respond? That's a kind of immediate calling to that situation. Then there are the bigger ones that have to do with where we work, ones that have to do with our church communities and so forth. Uh, I see all of these as the stations of life. Hmm. So we have a shared vocation or calling, which is to follow Jesus. That's our calling. And then we, in our own ways, in our own lives, have all these different stations, which are represented by the needs around us. And we need to address those. And some of those are outright needs for the gospel. And others are needs in communities where the gospel resides and people are growing and being nurtured. But then they have other kinds of needs as well. And so I guess I grew up in a situation where I tend to see the needs around me and I want to do something about them. You talk about being an empathetic listener and practicing that as a discipline, not just as something that's accidental. This is not about a personality trait so much as it is a choice that you decided to become a good communicator, and that required learning how people communicate. And you understood that communication, the best kind of communication, starts with your ears, not your lips. That was probably easier for you because, as you admit in, in many of your writings, that you were very much an introvert and scared to death of communicating with others. You were afraid of what they might find out in your life. You're saying that that is the root of most communication problems, just simply the fear of being found out, that we're afraid of right. what it is within us. Is that a yeah, valid right. fear? Yeah, listening is the most important communication skill because listening orients us to reality, not the way we think things are, mm. but the way things really are. With listening, we become wise mm. as we find out the way things are. The fool is the person who speaks without listening because he or she doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Well, welcome to modern day online media. If we're in a Facebook generation where anger and opinion seem to be the currency, truth comes to us through the word over all these thousands of years that listening is where wisdom begins. What's your advice then from studying this throughout a lifetime to a generation that seems to start with shouting and end with a roaring rush of opinions. Boy, you did a wonderful job of describing our current situation. We live in a very, very noisy time, and everybody thinks that they've got the method of fixing it, which has to do with technology and transmitting. The people who can transmit more messages supposedly are the powerful people and the shapers of public opinion and the proponents of truth and so forth, when often they are the ones that are propagandizing. Yeah. Listening is radical and it's subversive. Hmm. And what it takes is for us to concentrate with both our mind and our heart on one thing at a time, hmm. one thing at a time. There is no such thing as multitasking yeah. when it comes to listening. So what I say to people in mentoring them into listening is to start spending some time each day thinking about, meditating on, and praying about one thing, just one thing. In fact, you might make a list of things, but take them one at a time and start concentrating. And almost always what they find out, Bram, is that that one most important thing, or maybe the top five, are relationships. Relationship mm -hmm. with God, with particular other people, or their relationship with themselves as they begin listening to God, listening to other people, and listening to themselves, they start to get acclimated to reality. But you have to push out everything else, all the other noise, and invest the time. 
This seems to harken back to a book that really formed me a lot in my teens and early 20s, Richard Foster's The Celebration of Discipline, and how the rediscovery of the disciplines as formed by the faith leaders of Christianity as we know it today radically transformed them and enabled them to think differently and to communicate differently, and it transformed the entire world. The idea of inculcating the habits of Jesus into our own habits and our lifestyle has a radical effect. It does, and in fact, Jesus practiced it as well, going off away from other people for meditation and prayer. I'm actually writing a book right now Mm. on public speaking for Christians. I wrote one some years back, and I'm doing a radical update on it, because one of the things I've noticed is that those of us who believe we are called now and again to speak to others in some public fashion, it could be small groups in churches or whatever, if we don't spend the time alone in prayer and meditation, getting oriented to reality Mm -hmm. before we speak, we are not going to be effective and we're not going to be truthful speakers. So working on our own hearts and minds through meditation and prayer is the beginning of really good speaking. You don't start with speaking. You start with that kind of listening. Yeah. Now we're talking with uh, Dr. Q, Quentin Schultz, of many different hats, and you've acknowledged many people for how they've spoken into you. And one thing that kind of jumped out at me is that you acknowledge you didn't know how to teach until you had students, and the students taught you how to teach. Explain that to me. It's interesting that we are born without any ability to communicate. Mm. We have to learn it. And it's in the process of learning how to communicate that we are shaped by the people with whom we communicate. Mm -hmm. The people who we communicate with end up making us the kinds of people we are. From day one and how they respond to our cry for milk and how they respond to every other need from that point forward. Yes, all of it. All of it. So, you know, as a parent, you say to your kids, be careful who you hang out with Mm -hmm. because you're going to be like them. Exactly. That's the way we're made. So what I began to understand in my own life as I got into teaching was that these people that I thought I was going to be teaching, when I turned it around and listened to them, sometimes in immediate dialogue after I would say something, but sometimes I would just get to class and start listening before I even said anything and the class officially began And I realized that what the students were talking about and saying, I could learn from. And then I thought to myself, this is the way education really has to be. It has to be dialogical. Mm -hmm. And it, it was with Jesus. It was very dialogical. And often teaching is not so much telling people what to believe or value or passing along information, but it's asking questions. Yeah. And Jesus was superb at that. The rabbinical model right there. That's the rabbinical model. And the question for us today is, can we live that out in some way? And I think one of the few open doors we have today, because it's a word that people accept, is mentoring. Mm -hmm. Often the people that we start to mentor, that is, they are free to come to us and we can have conversations. We can ask them questions. They can ask us questions. After a while, we realize that no matter how much we started out mentoring them, they end up mentoring us as well. They do. Particularly when it's Christian folks together, that's yeah. the way the Spirit operates. Uh, the Spirit has a sense of humor. I have to learn from my kids, just on the technology side of things, what's the latest uh, app that's actually letting people to connect, how they connect, how they understand the world through the digital filter. I have to go to my kids just to understand better what's happening in this generation. But it's more than that. It's, it's me being willing to pursue them, to let them know that how they communicate, the world as they see it, how the world is being formed by them, is important to me. And I think about the need to learn from them is obvious in a family. They're not going to respect me if I don't even care about what they care about. But at the same time, it's a discipline you build into your life so that whether you're on the shop floor as a manager or you're leading a home fellowship at your own home and don't know how to start into a Bible study, or you're a pastor trying to lead a large congregation, or you're a CEO, you've worked with all of these people. So how would the servant leadership and, and willingness to learn from your students play itself out in different situations? Let's just start with this idea that the Spirit knows no boundaries Mm -hmm. and that God is already active in the world through the Spirit making things happen. Mm, Fair enough. And no matter where we are, no matter who we listen to, what we look at, what we observe, if we're attentive enough, we will see the work of God and we will learn from it. And frequently we learn the most in the situations where we expect to learn the least. So we want to hang around people who are influential, other leaders, when in fact, often we learn the most 
from those people who seem to have the least influence and the least power. I was speaking recently to a friend of mine at Calvin College that I retired from a few years ago, and I had been a professor there for 33 years. And I mentioned to this professor that one of the people that I thought was most influential with the students on that campus was not a professor. Hmm. And the person said to me, well, what was the person? Who was it? And I said, it was the person who runs a little cafe in one of the lobbies of one of the buildings. That this woman who runs that listens to what particularly the female students are saying day in and day out and talks with them and chats with them and advises them on life. And I saw this again and again, just sitting in the lobby, which I love to do and observe what was going on. And I thought to myself that this person should probably be paid as much as any professor on that campus probably should. because she probably has as much influence. Yeah. And I've told her that too. And so the spirit is alive and working. The question is whether or not we're observant enough to see, especially whether or not we're humble enough to listen to those around us who are not the powerful and the wealthy and all, because that's often where we learn the most. Yeah. Not the powerful and the wealthy yet but they are the seeds of greatness for a nation, for a culture, for history. I mean, who knows how many world changers have stepped through the campus all the years that you were teaching and are still moving through our institutions. We don't know who's going to be the one that leads all, not just by their example, but in places of authority granted by governments or by institutions or corporations. We're pouring into our future period by the kind of people we are in front of those who are becoming. Yes. In fact, it's so much a matter of what God is doing and paying attention to that. In fact, I think that's what Christian spirituality is about. It's Mm. attending to what God has done, what God is doing, and what God has promised. We have a good sense in Scripture uh, what God has done. We have redemptive history. Uh, We also have seen in recent weeks and years and decades and centuries what God has done in the world. Yes. And we have some sense of the future from Scripture. But living in the now is where we begin to have doubt. Is God really accomplishing anything and using us in any ways? If we don't accept that as a matter of faith, that God is working through us and others around us, uh, then I think we're being unfaithful. Yeah. Uh, We're denying the power of God. You mentioned in the last program that part of the responsibility of leadership is to take the quiet time to listen so that we don't end up telling untruths. In other words, we don't end up lying to ourselves or to others because we misunderstood the truth or we just didn't let it be analyzed and be evaluated. We didn't put it on the altar and say, God, what do you think about this? This is where my thoughts are right now. So we don't invite God to enter in early so we don't end up with him late. And you say in your introduction to this book, a fine book, Communicate Like a True Leader, you say to lead is to accept responsibility and then to act responsibly. So, Dr. Q, what is it that we need to take responsibility for if we're really going to serve Jesus and be leaders at least by example? And what is it that we need to act responsibly on in your mind? So let's go back to the beginning of Scripture. God creates the world, turns it over to Adam and Eve, and says essentially, take care of it, develop it. Yeah. You're stewards of it. Uh, I call that the cultural mandate. Often in theological circles, they'll call it that, the cultural mandate. It's a mandate to care for God's world and everything in it, to be caretaker stewards. We don't own the world. Mm-hmm. We're the caretakers. This is Compassion Radio with Bram Floria. We'll hear more from our guest, Quentin Schultz, next time. If you missed anything today, well, you can listen again anytime. Just open up your browser on your computer or smartphone or even your tablet and go to CompassionRadio.com. Again, it's CompassionRadio.com. Now, if you liked what you heard, please consider supporting Compassion Radio. First, with your prayers. You know, when you pray for us, God increases the effectiveness of this ministry by empowering the Compassion Radio team for service and by opening doors of opportunity for us to be a blessing to the body of Christ. And now second, would you please share this broadcast with a friend or a loved one? This is going to help us reach as many people as possible with the important work God is doing in the lives of those who live in a missional way. And really, that's all of us, you and I. Finally, please consider supporting this ministry financially. You can give a one-time gift, a semi-regular gift, or you can become a Compassion Radio Vision Team member. And that means a regular monthly gift for the amount of your choosing. 
You know, this ministry is 100% listener supported, and that means it's your gifts that make it possible for us to continue. You can support Compassion Radio right now by calling 800 868 2478 or by visiting compassionradio.com. That's 800 868 2478 or compassionradio.com. You can also text the word compassion to 53445. That's the word compassion to 53445. And of course, you can always mail your gift to Compassion Radio at P.O. Box 2770, Orange, California, 92859. That's P.O. Box 2770, Orange, California, 92859. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to listen, spend a little time with us. Be sure to join us again for more Compassion Radio with Bram Floria. This program is sponsored by Compassion Ventures Incorporated and your generous financial support.